Welcome back to most of you and for new folks. Welcome to our Science Phenomena event. Today is with Tiffany. Um, we do have a few housekeeping events um, or a few housekeeping notes. Um, one is renaming your Zoom to make sure it's you. Two, um, if you can leave your screens on, great. It's much more interactive for us and for you, but I understand if you have to turn it off, especially if there's connection issues. If you're using your iPhone, uh, send me an email um, with, your, with, your, with that information so I make sure to include you on the attendance. Um, if, if you have, when you have questions, we're gonna use the chat box and Megan is on the back end of it. And when we get to the Q and A, um, she will call on you to ask your question. And then you have to unmute and turn on your video if it's off to ask your question. And if you're having trouble, she can ask it for you. Um, remember that every day we're giving away five Amazon gift cards, but you have to be here to win. So stay tuned for the five winners for today, which is all done at random. Um, Chelsea's doing closed captioning. So Tiffany and I and Megan, we're all going to try to speak more slowly. So Tiffany, or so Chelsea can type when we speak. Um, thanks everyone yesterday for filling out the evaluation. It's only like five or six questions. We really appreciate the feedback, which was very positive and gave us some great ideas. So thanks for that. And then if, I also included a link to resources um, from all the scientists. And if you have things that you think are great resources, I would love to, to have you upload um, phenomena teaching. A lot of people are asking about, well, how can I teach this to fourth graders? Or how do I integrate this to my AP class? If you have resources you're willing to share, that's a place to do it as well. So we will get started today. Welcome, Tiffany. Um, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us about your, where your science story all began? Yes. So let me do a quick uh, screen share here. I can get started. All right. So welcome. Thank you guys for joining me. Can everyone see that title slide? We good? Yes. All right. So thank you guys for being here. It's an honor. My name is Tiffany Pereira. I'm an assistant research scientist with DRI. I'm just about coming up on my one year anniversary with DRI, which I'm very excited about. Um, but I'm here to also tell you about my science story because I didn't start off obviously with DRI and way back in the day, I actually wanted to be an animator. I have a background in art and science and I wanted to be a Disney animator, which right before high school ended up not working out so well because Disney actually shut down their animation studios. And growing up, I was given, uh, my parents took me to every free museum they could possibly get myself and my brother into. So I really did foster a love of the arts and science simultaneously. And in high school, I had an amazing AP environmental science teacher and he introduced me to the world of environmental studies, which I really didn't know was a field that you could get into. And it combined that love of exploration, natural resources, but also brought in the human element and how humans interact with the environment, uh, leading to fields such as conservation. And that really interested me that led me to pursue a degree in environmental studies at USC. It was actually a BA, not a BS in environmental studies because I thought I wanted to go down more of the advocacy and law route. Ended up deciding after graduating that that wasn't quite for me and I took my first field job out in Bakersfield, California. <laughs> Ooh, really <laughs> exciting. But the work itself was really exciting. We were actually working on a wetland where they were taking marginal farmland, turning it back into a man-made wetland, and the results were immediate. You could see migratory birds coming in, and that was it. I wanted to be in the field. I wanted to get my hands dirty. I wanted to 
build something, work on something, collect data where I could actually see those results. That led me to a job out here in the desert working at Lake Mead National Recreation Area down here uh, out of Boulder City where I live presently. And then I fell in love with the desert and to my mom's dismay, I never moved back to California and going on eight years, I am here in the desert. As you can see in the pictures, I've worked with desert tortoises. I've worked out at Lake Mead with Razorback Suckers. Uh, down in Death Valley, whole host of agencies, and that story now continues here at DRI. And I forgot to mention there is closed captioning available if you need that. It's at the bottom. All right, today we're talking about phenomena once again, uh, but with, with Tiffany's viewpoint on it. So can you tell us a little bit about one phenomena that you study in your work as a scientist? Indeed I can. So when it comes to the desert, um, for those of you in the South, you're dealing with the Mojave Desert. In the North, you're dealing with the Great Basin Desert, these two beautiful desert systems. And a lot of times, people from other places in the world, other parts of the country even, when they look out at the desert landscape, they often think, oh, it's this barren, bleak, desolate wasteland. But really, this is just not the case. The desert actually is a amazing landscape with diversity, abundance of diversity, not only in animal life, but in plant life. And what's interesting about this is all these, this plant life has to adapt to this desert environment that does have uh, interesting obstacles to get over, like the heat, desiccation, where they can't dry, they have to not be able to dry out, water, issues like that and these plants specifically because of their adaptations uh, are actually able to provide what's called ecosystem services to other wildlife such as animals and really pro um, provide the basis of being able to allow this ecosystem to thrive. So the phenomenon that I focus on is looking at this diversity, looking at these species, why are they here? What, a, what adaptations allow them to be here? What are those services that they're providing to other wildlife species? And of course, what are these actual species? What are their names? And how do they fit into the landscape? Why is this phenomena a good example of the skills needed to figure it out? And basically, why should kids care or be motivated about our native plants? So excellent question. So I will include some of these resources in the um, resource folder that AJ mentioned. But this quote is actually from the Nevada Heritage's, Heritage Society. And Nevada is actually the 11th among all states in total species diversity, sixth among all states in number of unique endemic species. That means they're not found anywhere else on earth. That includes 64 different springtail species, and it's eighth among uh, diversity in butterfly species, and ninth among all states in mammal diversity. And I wonder how many people knew that, uh, let alone your, your students. We really do have a beautiful state that we live in. And part of the reason for this incredible diversity in our Mojave and Great Basin deserts is that Nevada is actually the most mountainous state of all the 50 states. And those beautiful ranges and basins, uh, we even have a park called Basin and Range National Monument, allows for that diversity. We have these pockets of endemism and the highs and the lows create this, these differences. And so I encourage students to really get out and learn more about this beautiful state that they live in. And when I specifically talk about plants, I call it another lens 
to view the world. And so the looking at it at that as a gray brown palette really take a closer look. And first that involves critical observational skills that can then be adapted to anything else that they're doing really um, in their lives. So on a micro scale, it's looking at those flowers, looking at those plants and taking two yellow flowers. Maybe they look similar from a distance, but if you get up close, are they the same species? What do their petals look like? What do the leaf structure, what does the leaf structure look like? And starting to take a critical eye to discerning those differences. But then we can back it up to a landscape scale. So a macro, larger scale, uh, if you're doing, if you're in the south, doing the drive from uh, down in the valley all the way up to Mount Charleston, it's looking out the window of your car and noticing, hey, are the plants changing? We're in this, this valley, but now as we're going higher, we're noticing some more Joshua trees. And now we're in pinyon juniper. How did that happen? Um, and taking a look at those differences at that scale. And finally, when it, when it comes to plants, we also wanna figure out what exactly those species are. And identifying plants uh, can take some time, but in the day of technology, we have amazing apps like iNaturalist that help community scientists take pictures and you have a whole host of scientists on there that are ready to ID your plants and you can see what's in your, what's in your community. And what I do as a scientist is I identify those plants and I identify why they're important, such as in this uh, slide, you have the desert dandelion, which is one of the most important uh, forage species for the desert tortoise, who's also pictured um, in this slide. Let's dig a little deeper. What is the pattern that you study related to this phenomenon? All right. So for one of my projects, that I'm working on. I'm actually doing what's called a botanical inventory of Tule Springs Fossil Beds National Monument. It's found down here. It's on the north end of Vegas. It's actually a unique park because it butts up right against residential communities all the way from the Aliante Casino all the way north through Corn Creek. So it really does address this wildland urban interface and a botanical inventory involves identifying every single plant that is found on that monument to not only create a checklist, but to give the managers, the resource managers there, a way to identify what's on their monument, what sensitive and special species are out there and where they're distributed. And it also involves collecting voucher specimens, as you can see in the picture, I am laying out a sensitive species, the Las Vegas bear poppy, uh, to make a pressed specimen. And this specimen becomes a physical voucher, kind of like a, a tag to say, yes, this species was found here. It'll go to the herbarium up in Reno as a permanent collection uh, so they know what was found there. And some genetic studies could even be done on it in the future. Now, our work involves kind of figuring out where we have to go out to. So covering as much ground as possible. So it involves some very long field days and me hiking with my partner for quite some time. But we also have to take a look at what's driving those diversity um, or diversity drivers, what's driving the diversity. And as I talked about with those critical observation skills, so we're going to look at different landscapes. So where is there more water on this monument? We have some floodplains, we have some historic wells, which are really interesting. We're also looking at temperature differences. So we have to go out during different seasons, different plants are going to be coming up at different times. Right now it's a little hot, I just finished up my main spring collection, but once we start getting the monsoon season, there's a whole slew of plants that are gonna 
uh, come up and they're going to flower later in the summer. And then we have ones that flower and seed in the fall. So it's not just your springtime super bloom, hashtag super bloom that you hear. You really do need to pay attention to those plants and see when you want to go out. Elevation is another issue. So we go to the lowest point on the monument. We also go to the highest point on the monument, see the differences. In our case, uh, there isn't a huge elevation gradient, but we do have some areas where there are a lot more Joshua trees, which indicates that is a slightly higher elevation. Soils, this is what this park is known for. We have these extensive badlands, these gypsum and limestone areas where these fossils are found and you get plant communities that have adapted to only be on these special soil deposits and the Las Vegas bear poppy is one of those it does prefer gypsum soils you could see in the picture these massive gypsum crystals can actually form on the surface these really cool crusts and then of course we do have disturbed landscapes unfortunately because of that urban wildlife interface I was talking about uh, with the park. Historically, it's unfortunately been used as a dumping ground and a shooting ground. So there are actual true hazmat sites out on the monument that EP, the EPA might even have to get involved with cleaning up. But it's nice that it's being protected now. And part of my work is to allow these managers to help make those decisions in the future about how they're gonna take care of their natural resource um, properties on the monument. Great, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Um, an investigable question is one that students can answer through systematic observations and interpretations of data. What is it, what is it about the phenomenon, your phenomena, that provides investigable questions? All right, so when I, I'm going to relate it to the Tule Springs Fossil Beds work uh, specifically when it comes to the, uh, the native plant phenomenon. And what's interesting about this project is that you can argue that it isn't hypothesis driven, but you can also argue that it is. So when I first was going out or planning the field work, I'd take a look at those different landscapes, kind of what I was talking about. Where's the highest elevation? Where's the lowest elevation? What are those plant communities? Uh, just from historic references, what are those looking like? And because Tule Springs is kind of nestled in these nice alluvial fans, some creos or it's relatively creosote dominated, I don't have a giant mountain range in the middle of it. I don't have a wetland in the middle of it. I can hypothesize, or I can hypothesize uh, from the get-go that uh, our, our plant species diversity is going to be fairly low. So that could be my hypothesis. Like we, because of, or given the lack of landscape or elevational gradient and um, differentiation, we're going to have a lower plant diversity on this monument. However, despite having a lower species diversity, and we're almost up to 200 different species, so I'm talking about relative numbers here. Um, so we're almost at 200 species, which if you didn't know there were at least 200 different species of plants in the desert, now you know. <laughs> um, so despite that kind of hypothesis, it's not necessarily a bad thing that there is a lower species diversity on this monument because the land managers don't know what's out there. So in getting this baseline data, it's, these data is go, are going to lead to further questions. For example, when it comes to the sensitive plant species, we found that there's an area where we have two bear poppy species, the Las Vegas bear poppy and the Merriam's bear poppy, where they're actually overlapping, which is a very unique thing to have 
on the monument. And there's a whole slew of questions that could then be asked about why that is and what pollinators are pollinating each. Are they differentiated even though they're overlapping? So on and so forth. So these baseline data are going to lead to more questions in the future. In the course of your career, I'm sure that you have generated many research questions. What makes a good question and what are some common errors? Yes, so when it comes to a lot of my work specifically, I am working with agency stakeholders. So in the case of Tule Springs, that's with the National Park Service. And I've also worked with BLM, uh, US Fish and Wildlife Service, so in some cases, I have to work with them on a good question. For example, I was reach our US Fish and Wildlife Service reached out to me and they said, okay, so we have a candidate plant species. It's a astragalus species that has been petitioned to get listed by the Endangered Species Act. And it has to go through this whole process to get listed and they have to make that determination. However, they can't make that determination if they don't have the right data. And so I was approached um, by the scientists and she said, hey, one of the things in the petition is that this plant is getting outcompeted by invasive species, so invasive plant species that are taking over its habitat. And while that may be true, we don't understand the mechanism as to why that's happening. Can you design an experiment that addresses that question? And so from that concept, I then take a step back and think of how I can design an experiment, how I can design a hypothesis that tests something that answers um, the question and the concept that they, the gap that they're trying to fill, uh, if that makes sense. So they're not asking for a specific outcome. That's very different. They're asking, hey, we want to know more about this. And then it's my job to then take those questions. So it's a, it's a collaborative, uh, collaborative, excuse me, push and pull as to what their gaps, what their data gaps and what they need. And then a broad scope or a narrow scope. And eventually those questions will then hopefully lead to some more questions and some more funding to me to answer more of those questions. That's great. A big part of your job when mentoring future science scientists is teaching people how to think. What mentorship advice do you have to help students move from memorizing to asking questions to figure it out? Yes, and in the beginning I did mention that I am an artist and a scientist and you know when Disney shut down their animation studios and and whatnot, I, I was sad and I found this route into science, but the art never left me. Art was my, uh, fine arts was my minor in college. And a lot of times I feel that students that I've mentored or just what I hear, people like to kind of create this distance between art and science between the creative parts of their brain just be like hey if you want to be a scientist you can't be an artist or if you if you're a creative person you're not going to be good at math and that is just not not the case and what's really beautiful actually uh, is in the last few years i've actually been able to pull back in the creative and the art, especially fine arts, so scientific illustration back into the work that I do. Uh, the image on the bottom with the dinosaurs, that's actually in the Nevada State Museum here in Las Vegas because they wanted a depiction of a Cretaceous floodplain. 
and they asked a botanist, hey, can you illustrate these plants that could, would be found there at that time? And I worked with my partner to create this scene. And then even with the plants press specimens, it really is an art, the way that you have to, as, as that cacti um, demonstrates, you have to slice these things open, put them out, lay them out so that it makes a nice specimen. Uh, and even when it comes to taking pictures, that's a relic leopard frog. I'll be going out on Saturday to volunteer to take some pictures because they have to be able to tell the frogs apart for their data collection. And that's an art. So when it comes to designing experiments, when it comes to thinking about science, and even more so when it comes to communicating science, that's an art. And it's something that we need to get creative about, especially right now, um, about how we can put these data out there in a way that people will understand and relate to and hopefully get engaged themselves. So I really stress not only to the students that I mentor, but for everyone who's mentoring young people, um, they can address both sides of that and to not try and damper one over the other. Great. And this is such a great connection, I think, for all teachers, just to be able to kind of have that permission to bring in the arts to your science classes, because it really can engage some of those kids that may not be as engaged as you would like them to. So thanks, mm -hmm. Tiffany, for that. So the next part, um, Tiffany, if you want to, um, stop the screen sharing and yeah. just have your face. And then all the participants, this is your chance to ask questions. Um, Megan will read through your questions in the chat and then she'll pick the ones that are appropriate for this talk and then she'll call on you. So then if you can unmute and turn on your video if possible or just unmute, you can ask your question um, and Tiffany will answer it. Great, thanks AJ. Um, first question is from Chrissy. Chrissy, do you want to ask your question about uh, deserts? Hi. Hello. I wanted to ask, um, how are the boundaries for the American Southwest deserts determined, and are the animals and plants found in each that different? That is an excellent question. So, uh, and I'm, I have notes, so I'm kind of taking, so I make sure I address everything. So as far as the boundaries go, we really don't have a hard pressed boundary. So if you step over this line, you're in the Great Basin, or you step over this line, you're in the Sonoran Desert. It mostly has to do with temperature and precipitation. So we have our Sonoran Desert that's going to be wetter we have our Mojave Desert that's going to be hotter uh, and drier. And we have our Great Basin Desert that's going to be colder and wetter. And not only wetter, but most of that precipitation is going to fall as snow. But where those boundaries overlap, we refer to those as ecotones. So you'll end up having a blend of the two. In fact, that's what makes... Um, Lake Mead National Recreation Area kind of special is because if you go further along into Lake Mojave, you start getting the ecotone of Mojave and Sonoran Desert. So you'll find Sonoran Desert plants, you'll get some smoke trees, you'll get some acapillo, um, but you'll also get Joshua tree. <laughs> so, um, and those, those plants that are more dominant in each of those desert will fade out as you as you go along and then finally they'll they'll fade out all together good question next one comes from margaret margaret are you there sorry about that couldn't get it unmuted no worries okay <laughs> 
So when you're looking at the different species as part of your research, do you look mostly at phenotypes or do you look at DNA differences as well? So great, great question. I specifically will look at the phenotypes. I'm, I'm old school. I'll be keying these species out using dichotomous keys, using the Jepson manual, using intermountain flora. Um, so true, true botany there. However, a lot of our species differences or the way they're splitting uh, families or even genera now relates to genetic differences. And there, there are analyses available now that scientists and botanists couldn't have dreamt of when some of these plants were named. So then I have to memorize a new genus <laughs> when they decide, when they decide to split those. However, uh, I don't do that specifically myself, but I would like to learn and might start doing some of that work with UNLV in the future. It'd be great if I could like zap something and figure out what it was and not have to, <laughs> to ID or look under the scope for a couple hours and ID different parts of plant. But I love it. It's fun. You can tell that passion really shines through. Um, the next question comes from Samuel College. Samuel, are you there? Want to ask your question? Yeah, so you, you talked about uh, setting the stuff up to Reno. Uh, mm -hmm all the different types of, of items that are in Chewy Springs or mm -hmm. uh, plants. Is there a, a place online where the general public can access to see what type of items are in a certain area? Yes, absolutely. And I will put uh, the info for that in the, in the, oh my gosh, just drew a blank, in the folder, that a, a folder system that AJ set up, but the herbarium networks online so there's intermountain flora and Cynet. you can actually search in a county you can search in a in a city and you'll see what what has been vouchered in your area in the past and what's beautiful about this is actually some of them are historical you can pull up a voucher specimen of a creosote from a hundred years ago and um the major herbaria in the country do have their specimens online. And um, what's nice about my specimens, they're actually behind me in boxes right now <laughs> in, in my room. Um, they'll be digitized. So you can not only see the herbarium voucher label, but you can actually see the whole pressed plant too. So Jerry team up at Reno will be, will be doing that but I'll, I'll make sure you guys have that link to be able to, to see those specimens and show the students as well. That is so cool. Um, Linda Enrico has two questions. Linda, do you wanna ask your first one? And maybe we can follow up with the second one later. Sure. Can you hear me? So you said that you work with tortoises in the beginning. Are there experiments that you've done? We've heard that they've been endangered. Are they still endangered? And do you currently do work with the tortoises in the Las Vegas Valley? All right, so a couple parts of that question. So first part, uh, they are currently still listed. They're listed under the Endangered Species Act. Uh, they are less listed as threatened. So that's the level below endangered so they aren't quite endangered and I, I don't believe there's any um, any data to suggest they would be upgraded at any point right now uh, there are a lot of agencies and a lot of collaborative effort to prevent them or to not okay so prevent them from getting upgraded but also try to downlist them at some point unfortunately uh, in the desert, we still have stiff competition of habitat fragmentation because of solar development and what have you. So right now, I, I can't comment specifically on the status of the species other than it's holding 
at that threatened level. And I don't work with tortoises um, the way that I used to. I used to go out and track them every day. I'd go out with a receiver and an antenna and I would track their movements, which very special because you'd come across them in all kinds of different uh, situations. <laughs> I've seen, I've seen fights, I've seen mating, I've seen babies, I, the whole, the whole ringer. Um, but I hope to work with tortoises again, hopefully out at Tule Springs, just worked with the resource manager out there to uh, do a tortoise, I guess it could be called a tortoise inventory instead of a botanical inventory, just to help with going back and checking historical burrow data. So going back to those burrows, seeing if they're active and doing a survey to try and determine how many tortoises are on the monument. That sounds really positive. Um, the next question, I'm gonna actually combine a question from Foster with a question that we got on the registration form. So we have heard through the news that there are reports of people seeing more wildlife with uh, decreased traffic and, and decreased human movement and activity with COVID. So is it true that wildlife is actually extending their ranges or is it that we're observing it more? And if you have any comments specifically about Wake Mead, that's what Foster is asking you about. So is it a myth or truth? Myth or truth that wildlife is extending its ranges, its range. And if there's anything about Lake Mead that you can comment on in terms of cle clearing up about COVID or clearing up during the COVID uh, shutdown time, feel free to comment on that too. All right. So that's a, that's a good question. And I, I believe there are instances around the world where you could definitely say that the lack of humans just being present in great numbers. Um, for example, in India, there was, there was a beach that's normally crowded and they had hundreds of sea turtles out laying eggs, which they've just never had before. So I, I would say that's a, a clear example of that. A little less clear maybe in the desert because we do have species such as coyotes. It's always a a fun topic in Boulder City in the community groups. People like posting pictures whenever they see one around. And um, that's what they do. They're actually incredibly smart and they have been increasing their range across, across the US. This area, of course, was part of their native range, but they're increasingly found in urban, um, urban settings. And in fact, there's research being done specifically on urban populations of different animals, specifically coyotes, uh, to con continue with that example. So they for sure are increasing their range. Um, not sure if their presence has been heightened because of COVID. But in the parks, I would imagine in Lake Mead, um, wildlife being able to be out and about without the threat of getting hit by cars. I know they shut down the, the roads through the park for quite a while. And one of the things Endow does, they have volunteers do what's called road cruising at night to look for snakes specifically. Uh, which is a fun thing to volunteer for if you ever want to <laughs> go out and record what snake species you're saying. You don't have to touch them. You just have to see what they are. Um, so I'd imagine there were maybe some more snakes out on the asphalt. They like it because it collects heat and then they go out and kind of chill on the asphalt and get all warm at night. So you can see more of them. Uh, so I'd imagine maybe some more snakes were out on the asphalt without the risk of getting hit by a car, but I can't say for sure. So. That will be something interesting maybe to monitor over, over <laughs> long periods of time. Yeah. I personally wonder if, you know, if we just had more time to see them. Because yeah. They're out yeah, I said those critical things. observation skills. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And that's actually a great segue to the next question from 
Norit. Norit, do you want to ask your question about maybe Tiffany's opinion on inquiry? We're going to get her opinion from as the perspective of a scientist on this question. If Norit's not able to, to cue in, I will read the question. Um, so they're wondering, how important is teaching students to respect varying ideas about content compared to teaching for correct answers? So I will ask you, in the course of your education and career, how important is that? The, you know, we're taught as scientists to be skeptical and um, to question things, and we know that we're always working at the edge of what's known and what's not known. So maybe you could comment on, on that aspect of inquiry and the role that it's played in your career. Hmm. That's an excellent question. Sorry, I have to think about how to take your time. Word it. I just always think there's there's so much left to learn and kind of alluding back to the uh, the question that was asked about um, using genetics for plant identification, something that I don't do presently, but I am more than open to learning and integrating into my work in the future or collaborating with someone that does. So I just think there's always more to learn and to be discovered. So there's, what was I gonna say? Like I wouldn't call it skeptical necessarily, but just a desire to know more, if that makes sense. It's not, not really a skeptical eye necessarily, but I, I mean, I do know researchers where you can see it in their publications. They'll like call each other out. They'll have like these long rebuttals against each other, like in a publicated or published format. And you're like, oh gosh, but you know, at the end of the day, they're both pushing the field forward, albeit in a kind of a, personal <laughs> skeptical manner. Um, this happens in fire ecology a lot. If you look at the fire ecology um, publications, some, it's not a very big community, especially if they're all working in the Sierras. So you know who they're talking about when they're, when they're throwing some shade in their, in their publications. <laughs> so it's not necessarily skepticism, but you know, can we, can we push this further? Can we know more? What other questions are left to ask? I'm hearing an emphasis on curiosity, which, yeah. which yeah. Is, <laughs> is a thread that ties into our, our talk yesterday too. So mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. really great. Um, the next question, Crystal Cole Polkowski, do you wanna hop on? Ask another question related to the classroom and students. Hi, I'm actually an art teacher, so I was wondering um, if you like to sketch when you're out in the field, and if so, what kind of art supplies do you like to bring with you? Yes, so I do sketch in the field sometimes. Um, let's see, so I do work in some areas where we aren't allowed to take cameras or phones. So if I want an overview picture of the landscape, I actually make a data sheet that has a box where I'm like sketch of the landscape and I just I do it in pen I do it in pencil and get a general idea of the of the um the landscape just as as time allots for me to to get a quick uh general overview if I if I do have a bit more time I'll I'll take a sketchbook and a pencil you you don't need too much more than that if you if you are going to go out and have 
an even longer amount of time, then I do like things that are a little quicker. Watercolors, always a favorite, or pastels, another favorite uh, thing to work with. And then if you have infinite time and you want to get ambitious, you can take paints out, <laughs> like acrylic, acrylic out if you really want to. But some of those beautiful early sketchbooks from like Darwin, he was, a, he was a, a scientific illustrator as well. If you look back at his, his monumental um, publication, Origin of Species, he drew those finches. And I'm pretty sure he did that in ink. He also employed other illustrators to help him with some of those concepts too. So ink, ink, pencil, paper old school like those guys were and then you can always bring those back and color them if you want to oh and pressed plants that's another thing it's really easy to get pieces of wood or use a really heavy book and press some plants students i'm sure you get lots of comments about the the style of botanical uh illustration that it, People, people tend to frame those mm -hmm. their styles. I, I personally just love it. Um, Greg Friedman, are you on? You have a great question. It's, it's again turning to. Yes, I'm on. Go ahead. Um, yesterday I was on at the meeting. They were talking about the climate change, the temperatures being higher now. Um, now with the temperatures getting higher, are any of the species of plants endangered because of that? Or do they, are their adaptive abilities able to comprehend, to, to adjust to this? Excellent question. So unfortunately, when it comes to plants, they're relatively sedentary. <laughs> it, they can't pick up and move. And, um, you know, when it comes to some populations in conferences, the word or the term assisted migration gets thrown around a lot where we actually consider being able to move species um, as those climate or temperature and precipitation gradients shift. A lot harder to even consider that when it comes to plant populations. And to use an example, um, okay, first off, the Joshua tree, uh, Joshua tree, uh, yucca, brevifolia, is now, it's been split relatively recently into two separate species. So the species that's found in Joshua Tree National Park is actually different than the one that I have out on Tule Springs. The one in Tule Springs is yucca jaegeriensis. And yucca brevifolia is actually being petitioned to list as under the Endangered Species Act for that reason, because in Joshua Tree National Park, they're seeing a loss of recruitment. And that has to do with pollination, that has to do with temperature, precipitation. There is a future where Joshua Tree National Park potentially will not have Joshua trees in it, live ones. Um, the range is shifting. And um, when it comes to transplanting, you could transplant some, but they, they take years, years, hundreds of years to grow. Um, and if you're gonna tra try transplanting a grown tree, I mean, is it Joshua Tree National Park anymore? Um, so those are the kind of questions. Uh, and I use Joshua Tree as an example because it's a beloved park. I grew up in Southern California. I spent a lot of time there. And that's, that's sad. Um, but difficult questions that are, being, that are being asked. And that's just one species. And that's a species that people care about. It's the symbol of the Mojave Desert, let alone species that are um, the ones that people don't know much about. Great question. Related one comes from Christina Stark. Yeah. Christina, are you on? I uh, yes. I was just wondering about which invasive species um, are some of the biggest threats to our native plants. All right. 
So a lot of different invasive species, especially in the Southwest. Um, I don't know if anyone's on here from Tucson, but they're having major uh, fires right now. I haven't checked today on the status of it, but one of the drivers of that fire, um, and so that's Sonoran Desert there, uh, is buffalo grass. It's a invasive grass. It's big. It's obnoxious. And because of that, it's altered the wildfire regime in that area. And it's, you know, we have saguaros burning um, that wouldn't burn in the way that they are now. So that's an example of a native grass there. We have, or in, excuse me, invasive grasses there. We have invasive grasses here, such as schismus. Um, and then we have um, Sahara mustard, which is a huge problem in Lake Mead. We also have tamarisk, so salt cedar. That one's an interesting one because it's outcompeted a lot of the other riparians like around the shoreline, different uh, trees and shrubs would grow. So it's kind of outcompeted that and it forms these big stands. But we have an endangered species, the southern willow flycatcher, that likes using it as nesting grounds. So now we have this war between, oh, we want to get rid of the tamarisk, but now it's providing habitat for this endangered species. Darn it. So <laughs> um, sometimes these questions get, can get tricky as well. And then you get people on two different camps that are kind of warring at each other, but we're all on the same trajectory of conservation generally. Um, going to symposiums can be fun in, in, these, in these cases. But yeah, the buffalo grass is one that came to mind when you asked that because it's an, it's an active fire area right now. And it's sad a lot of people have had to evacuate and we're losing saguaros to that, which take hundreds of years to grow themselves. So. Wow. For people in northern Nevada or the Great Basin Desert, they might relate to cheatgrass. Is the buffalo grass yeah. challenge the same kind of cycle and play the same kind of role? Yep. So yeah. the deserts have these invasive grasses have changed the wildfire regimes in, in all of our deserts, really. Okay. All right, we have time for one more question from Chris Johnson. Are you on, Chris? Yeah. Um, so so with the yesterday hearing, uh, there's a big increase in population here in Nevada. Um, what is a good way of us insisting plant life in this area for us to minimize impact on our desert, on the desert? Good question. In terms of at a governing level or to your students, sorry to uh personal students uh governing i mean probably easier personal okay okay uh yeah so i, I guess i could i can go through the through the levels on a personal um and i'll i'll put this in in the in the resources folder but just getting your students and even you yourself to to learn about the different plant species, especially the ones that might be sensitive or special. iNaturalist is a really great app because it's an app and you can take pictures. It's user friendly. You can see what's around in your area and it's, you can kind of create a challenge. I think there's even a way you can make a project for your class and have them go out and try and amass a collection of what they can find in in their area and once you start taking a look it's like as i said putting on those lenses to see the world in a different way i mean some of these plants are pretty special they're small um taking a look at those like people hear the hashtag super bloom and they don't really understand what that means there's a process behind that and different plants come out at different times of, times of the year. You get plants during the spring, get plants in the fall. 
so on and so forth. So encouraging your students to take a closer look. And then when it comes to kind of the next tier up of just management, local management, getting people involved to be like, hey, let's plant native species. Let's not bring in invasives uh, into the area. Get involved with your local native plant nurseries or um, uh, what is it? The May Arboretum up in the Reno area. They're working on a new cactus and succulent garden. So getting involved with, with places like that. And then uh, if there's a way to, because not everyone could go out there, sign the petition, be on top of all the different legislative items that are, that are in the running. But when it comes, especially down south, uh, every now and then they'll put out comment sections or comment periods for new solar developments or um, in the north there's the critically endangered team's buckwheat and they're trying to put uh, your lithium mine literally on the only population of this plant in the world and we're like can you move the plant over like there and put it there instead. So there's a comment period for that. And you can make your voice known if you want to. Of course, that, you know, asking your students to do that, that I'll leave that up to you guys how you how you want to address those challenges. And <laughs> one of my my AP environmental teacher probably couldn't get away with this today, but he said he'd give us extra credit if we went to this protest <laughs> against <laughs> solar plants. So don't do that. I'm not, I'm not <laughs> advertising that you do that. But, um, you know, there's a way to get your, your students thinking about these questions and then they can make their own decision about what they, like just reading environmental news. There we go. <laughs> That's great. And I, I could see a, a clear connection with the, if the students were in a participation in government class, there's some mm -hmm. interdisciplinary dialogue that could happen. Yeah, them. please don't let the takeaway be like encourage the students to go to environmental protests. <laughs> but that, that lifelong curiosity is what, what we're <laughs> really still Awesome. So, um, AJ, do you want to hop on and, and let us know who the raffle winners are now? I do. Thanks. And I did take attendance, so I think I'm good. There's a few missing people, so if, if your name isn't showing up, please let me know. All right, so my random generator today. We have five winners. Uh, the first one is Greg Lim from Bishop Gorman. Greg, are you here? You want to say hi? Yeah, I'm here. Yay, you won the first one. The next one is Wendy Weeks. Are you here, Wendy? I am. I'm the one. It's actually Paris in the background. It's no true. Awesome. <laughs> well, you need a gift card to hang out in Paris. Um, the next one is Shaka John from Edmundo. Are you here? Yeah, I'm here. All right. You won gift card number three. We have two more. We have um, this one. I'm not sure if she's here. Joyce Chapman, are you here today? Okay. And then uh, how about Shaniqua Welsh? That's the other one. I wasn't sure if she was here. All right. So the, the next two, since those two don't seem to be here, are uh, Melissa Thompson from Smith Valley. I'm here. Yay. And last but not least, Randy King. I think you Hi. are. <laughs> Yay. And we will send those out either at the end of this week or the beginning of next week to the address you guys provided. The other thing too is uh, Megan will share a link to the evaluation, basically the same one you filled out yesterday. If you were here with us yesterday, it's just a Google form. It's anonymous. Uh, we would love to get your feedback um, on your reactions. 
Um, it's also, there's also a spot for questions. Um, we will upload additional documents. And if you, during this presentation, realize that you want certain documents, you can ask for them and we will try to find them for you. And if you have awesome lessons or resources to share, there is a folder for you um, as teachers to upload whatever you think is great. Just, I ask that you title it with something that makes sense so people can kind of sort through all these amazing resources and work together um, to do so. So um, Megan did put the link in the chat if you guys want to go to your chat and you can click on that and it is 430 on the nose. We really appreciate your time. We know it's summer for all of you. Um, much deserved, I know. So I hope you guys have a great day. I will see many of you back here tomorrow, hopefully most of you, mm -hmm. um, and have a great day. Does anyone else have anything to add? I just wanna thank you guys so much for being here and for everything that you guys do. Thank um, you, Tiffany. Appreciate it. Yeah. And I'll make sure those resources are up um, by the end of the day tomorrow. I'll have some links and some articles in there on uh, my resource folder. Great. And if we can all do, you know, happy thank you to Tiffany. Yay. Thanks, Tiffany. Woo. Now, thank you guys for what it was you a great did. day. Appreciate it.